Hello there, and welcome back again to our YouTube channel. James here as ever for today's video all about ACCA financial management and investment appraisal. If this is the first time you visited my channel, my name is James, I'm an ACCA qualified member from the UK, and on my channel I help our ACCA students around the world pass their upcoming exam. So uh, I assume by you clicking on this video, you're an ACCA student and you've probably got the financial management, that's the FM or F9 paper coming up and you've seen that in this video, I'm gonna go through the whole syllabus. This is actually lecture four of eight. So if you've missed any, make sure you click the link in the actual description. It's gonna take you to the full playlist so you get access to all of my free materials. If you're not aware as well, my actual channel is 100% student led and every video is dedicated to an ACCA student around the world. And today is no different because, as you can see up here, we have a lovely screenshot from a message I got sent on Instagram on my account from Ramshad. Thank you so much for getting in touch. And yes, the video will be with you before the actual June exams as well, my friend. So make the most of it. Get your pen and paper ready because these could be the little tips that could get you the 50 plus to help you pass your financial management exam. As I said, if you're, this is the first time you've visited my channel, make sure you subscribe so you get access to all of my free materials. The button will be below. And if you've got any questions from the recording, leave a comment or any feedback from the recording, whatever you've made of it. I really appreciate it and I'll answer absolutely all of them. Finally, whilst you're down there, make sure you give it a massive thumbs up so that more ACCA students can see my free content and I really, truly appreciate all the support. Thank you so much. But Ramshad and everyone else who's watching around the world, let's get stuck into the investment appraisal. As I said, a really key concept area that you need to get your head around to understand all of the key elements. So this is really gonna be helpful for you. So pen and paper at the ready, let's take down some good notes and enjoy the lecture. So on three and two and one and go. Hello and welcome to today's ACCA Financial Management F9 lecture all about investment appraisal. My name is James and in today's lecture, I'm gonna be talking through the four main key syllabus areas from the ACCA's direct website. As you can see on the screen, we have uh, point number one on here for investment appraisal techniques, which are absolutely fundamental for your revision for financial management in this module. Number two, allowing for inflation and taxation in discounted cash flow methods. So making sure that links into part one as well, we've just been through. And then three, we've got adjusting for risk and uncertainty in investment appraisal. So linking that to your scenario, you'll be asked within investment appraisal for financial management to discuss and calculate. So that's another key area there you need to be aware of. And finally, for point four, we've got specific investment decisions. That's leasing or to buy, asset replacement, and finally, capital rationing. So that's what we're gonna talk through in today's lecture on investment appraisal. And to get us started on here, but for, for point one from the ACCA syllabus, we've gotta talk about investment appraisal techniques. Now, these are absolutely paramount that you are comfortable, one, in calculating them, and then two, describing why they are good methods and the actual end result. You've got to be careful if you're going to be doing this as a computer-based question where you will be able to use Excel. So you've got to get really comfortable with the functions, especially as we go through all of these points on here from A to H. And it's all about showing your workings and labeling for the marker, especially for investment appraisal techniques, where you've got the figures from, any workings you've done, and how it flows through so that you get all the carried forward marks as well. Make sure you've got that down in your notes. But to get us started off on here for part A, we've been asked to actually identify and calculate relevant cash flows for investment projects. So this relates into the actual project life from when it starts, where we have the initial outlay in year zero, all the way to what details you'll be given in your question if this was to be tested for how long the project may be. So that relates into the actual project life. And then you've got to lay out within your columns and rows, whichever format you work best by doing. Well, what are the details then to say, well, can we identify the positive cash flows, whether that's revenue or if we made uh, sales of potential assets, and then minusing off any expenses as well, or if we've had to have any outlays for potential non-current assets that were required for the project. This now links into potential methods that you need to be comfortable with going into your financial management exam. 
So first of all, calculating the actual payback period and discussing its usefulness as an investment appraisal method. Well, you'll need to actually know the actual formula for it as you work through, but again, it all comes down to the actual table format, especially for payback and the other methods as we go through. But in essence, what you need to work out is the accumulated cash flow year on year and working out where from the initial outlay, which will say will be minus a thousand to start off with, then if you have positive cash flows of 400, 400 and 400, well, that, that would tell you that, well, okay, well, if I've got minus a thousand at the start, then plus 400, plus 400, plus 400. So the actual payback period is going to be between years two and three. And we'd have to work it out accordingly based on the cash flow in year three and the actual starting point at the start of year two. So it would be minus 200 divided by 400, and then that's where you'll get two and a half years. But again, that's gonna come with question practice. I just wanna make sure you're aware of the full syllabus going through today. This then links us on to calculating the discounted payback and its usefulness with the actual investment appraisal method. Now, as you can see on here, we've got payback and then we've got discounted payback. Discounted payback for your notes takes into account the time value of money, where we discount all of those cash flows year on year and we take into account the time value of money based on the cost of capital provided to you in the actual question. So that is one of the, that is the differential between the two methods. One takes into account the time value of money, which is good for investment uh, projects, versus the other payback method, uh, payback period method, which doesn't. However, the payback period method is reasonably easy to calculate as well, but these are the pros and cons that you need to be aware, aware of going into your examination. We've then been asked to calculate the return on capital employed, also known as the accounting rate of return, and discuss its usefulness, again, as an investment appraisal method. So again, going away from this, you need to know the actual formulas, how much was the initial investment, versus the actual total cash flows from, or shall I say total profits from the actual um, project that you were given in this case. You then, for part E on here, calculate the net present value, so NPV, and discuss its usefulness as an investment appraisal method. So this is where you get pros and cons coming into it that the net present value method takes into account all of the cash flows versus the payback period, which doesn't take into, a cash flow, take into account cash flows after the payback period. So you may have some huge cash flows into the future, but with the payback period method, you're only looking for when you go from it being a negative project to a positive cash flowing project. Also, I've been mentioning cash flows. Uh, the actual accounting rate of return uh, goes on the basis of profits, which can be more easy manipulated, whereas cash is, is, is a lot harder to do so. So again, more pros and cons that you need to be aware of going into this exam. You've then got asked for part F on here to calculate the internal rate of return. This, for your notes, links into NPV. So in essence, what you need to do is you need to calculate for the figures that you provided for the project uh, with the cost of capital, and it may give you a uh, positive NPV. And you take the exact same figures, apply a different cost of capital, hopefully it's going to give you a negative NPV, and then you're going to interpolate is the key word uh, coming on to this, you'll need to look at the formula as well within your actual core text, get familiar with it, apply the figures what you've used, and then you'll come to your IRR. But again, it takes into account all of the cash flows and the time value of money, just so we're crystal clear on it. And in essence, when you're going through these methods or what you use in practice is, yes, we're going to say, well, MPV, and we're gonna come onto it later, is, is superior for a number of reasons, but you can actually calculate all of them and make a decisive decision based on the project, utilizing all of them on here, if you really wanted to. We've also been asked on here for part G to discuss the superiority of discounted cash flow methods over non-discounted cash flow methods. So as we've discussed, make sure you've got down there the time value of money. Um, does it actually utilize cash flows? Also, are we referring to uh, cash flows rather than profit? Um, and then also, uh, are we actually uh, taking into account the scale as well? Because that's another key thing, or scope, should I say, for NPV, that you can get the same NPV for two projects, but one could be based on millions of pounds, and one could be based on tens of pounds. So it's, it, you've got to weigh it up based on it, and it all comes down to 
um, a level of difficulty going into it, um, taking into account all the cash flows, time value of money as we've discussed on that, along with other aspects. And then finally, we've got discussed the relative merits of MPV and IRR, which again, we've, we've talked about it as, well, you have to calculate the MPV to get to the IRR. You're gonna to have to go away and have a look at the diagrams for it, but as long as you've got now interpolation and working out that you're gonna to have to take the same figures, try a cost of capital, it may get you a positive MPV, then you've gotta take the same figures as we said before, apply it to a different cost of capital, and hopefully it's gonna get you a negative MPV. Pop them all in the actual IRR calculation, and then you can compare and contrast with interpolation to get the right answers. But they are mainly the superior methods for the reasons we've discussed in this, in this actual slide so far. They both take into account the time value of money. They both take into account all of the cash flows on here as well. Relatively uh, okay to actually calculate. Uh, IRR is deemed to be more trickier to calculate than the MPV, if you want to get that jotted down in your notes. So these are all fundamental issues that you would have to describe to the market in your piece of work. Secondly, now we've been asked to actually allow for inflation and taxation in discounted cash flows. So the next thing you need to be aware of is actually applying and discussing the real terms. OK, so we're just going to go through the key bits on here you need to get down and the nominal terms. OK, approaches to investment appraisal. Now, as you can see in the brackets, the real terms is adjusted for inflation. That is the key. Uh, aspect you need to get jotted down in your notes here and from nominal terms this these are the actual amounts that we are provided with within a question or a scenario so uh, in terms of economics uh, th this this could be um, in regards to wages for example how inflation every year actually reduces the value of your wages and impacts on your um, actual standard of living because if inflation is going up and your wage is staying the same and you are deemed to be worse off because the cost of goods are going up. And that's where it links into real terms, just as an example, versus the nominal term of your actual wage. That's what it comes down to. Nice and easy example. Now, we've got point B on here as to calculate the taxation effects of relevant cash flows, uh, including the tax benefits of allowable depreciation and the tax liabilities of taxable profit. Okay, so let's just break that down. Um, bit by bit as we go through. So the effects of relevant cash flow. So this is where it links into your project life going on year on year that you'd calculate the totals for, including the tax benefits for allowable uh, depreciation. So the depreciation would reduce the profit down and hence the tax liabilities would be lower as a result. That's the key thing. So make sure you get it jotted down as a potential adjustment, uh, especially in an MPV calculation. Then finally for part C, uh, calculation applied before and after tax um, discount rates. So this will be the cost of capital percentage that you'll be provided with within the examination. So you need to be looking at, okay, this is the real critical thing, uh, the PV factor tables, where when you're actually applying discount rates to a discounted cash flow question, it's always going to be using the 0.912 or 0.615, whatever it may be, and it, it works on the basis of two axes. So you're going to have uh, years up at the top, so that relates to how long your project is, and then you've got your percentage you've got to find on the other side, um, which will relate into, well, what's the cost of capital we've been provided with in the question itself? So make sure you've got that down as to say, well, am I familiar with the formula sheet for the financial management exam, and also the PV factor tables where one, which we're talking about now um, in regards to the discount rates, relates to discounted cash flows. And then you'll also have another one relating to annuities and perpetuities. So these are the key things that going into the exam, if you're aware of these, they are going to be a, a significant advantage to you. Also on top of this, uh, in terms of MPV, IRR, all these calculations, the more past paper questions you do uh, going away from this lecture size, the better off you're gonna be because then that's gonna highlight showing all your workings, your process going through it, identifying the actual uh, years of the project. Um, as I said, showing all your workings going through and then applying the correct discount rates before and after tax. So highlighting all the totals for the marker so you're going to maximize the amount of marks that you're going to get 
and doing your best to pass this exam. Now, coming on to point three on here. So point three, we're actually asking about adjusting for risk and uncertainty in investment appraisal. So risk and uncertainty, this is gonna come down to, well, what's the actual risk appetite of, of the potential management? But let's go through each of the uh, aspects on here where we're asked to describe and discuss the difference between risk and uncertainty in relation to probabilities and increasing project life. So probabilities of, of what is the likelihood in the actual project of it going ahead, or what are the probabilities in the actual project itself from the, think about this from the type of actual project you're looking at. So get jotted down to say, well, what are they actually going to be investing in? Is it, has it got a large outlay? Does it have any potential scrap value? Um, are we actually applying some hypothetical percentages that are potentially increasing 3% each year? What is the actual likelihood of this? Then that nicely links into increasing the project life to say, well, does it all go to plan? Is it, is it going to be a five year project that could turn into a six or a seven? So this is where, again, coming down to the, the classic technique for financial management of calculate the figures and then tell the mark of what is going on or what are the things, if you were a financial manager in that situation, you would have to be aware of. Part B, we're actually uh, asked to apply sensitivity analysis. So whenever you see sensitivity analysis, you've got to think about changing the variables, changing the variables to investment projects and discuss the usefulness of sensitivity analysis in assisting in investment decisions. Well, when we adjust for sensitivity analysis, again, changing those variables to be, is it going to be a slightly riskier project? I mean, are, are, are we going to be optimistic in, in our actual projections or are we going to be pessimistic and reducing those percentages or amounts, whatever they may be? So optimism or pessimism would be two key words that you'd be looking to actually get into your uh, descriptive answer here. And again, for part C, we're asked to apply probability analysis. So with those variables to investment projects and uh, discuss the usefulness of probability analysis in assisting in investment decisions on there. So probability analysis, sensitivity analysis, um, it's, it's all about with probability analysis, the likelihood on here, the likelihood. But it's all gonna come down to the specific scenario that you're given within your examination base it on the actual industry, the sector perhaps as well, that you will want to factor into your answer because the more you apply it back to that scenario, the more marks you are likely to get because some industries are going to be more riskier than others. So it could be in more raw materials like coal or gold, whatever it may be, um, or diamonds, whatever the sector may be, is going to be more riskier um, in terms of a probability factor versus potentially just making uh, a normal sort of project, uh, uh, products, for example, that you would sell in the marketplace. Part D, on the other hand, is asking us to apply and discuss other techniques for adjusting for risk. Um, and again, linking back to that scenario again, it's, it's all about the risk appetite of the actual financial manager that is in charge of these scenarios. So trying to pick out uh, if there are any clues within the actual requirement or the scenario to say, well, What's their risk appetite? Are they, are they quite a risk taker? So they're willing to take on more risk for a higher reward. Always link it with risk with, to reward within the financial management module. Or are they quite risk adverse? So they're not willing to take as much on board, but the trade-off there is, well, they're going to have a lower return at the end of the day. And uncertainty in investment appraisal, including, well, it's going to link back into simulation, uh, adjusted payback, and risk adjusted, uh, adjusted discounted fees. So again, it's all relating to the uncertainty, relating back to that scenario within the simulation of, think about it in the case of what could happen or what if. So are, you, are we looking from a, a pessimistic or an optimistic point of view here, link it to the investment appraisal, and then finally actually saying, well, what will be the decision that we are going to make? Um, from the adjustment and the simulation point of view. And, and the potential discount rates for say, well, what's the, what's the best possible rate that we can actually utilize within the business for the project? And then what's going to be the impact overall for a potential positive or negative MPV? 
So that nicely takes us on to part four now for these specific invest, uh, investment decisions. So leasing or to buy, asset replacement or capital rationing. So let's just go through it bit by bit on here where for part A we're asked to actually evaluate leasing and borrowing to buy using the before and after tax costs of debt. So being specific to debt, so leasing and borrowing, okay, to buy using before and after tax costs of debt. So the cost of debt is going to really be relating to, well, what is the current gearing and what is the, what are the current factors within the scenario that you're given? Are, are they a completely 100% organically grown, 100% equity company? And then are we saying, well, what, what, the, what the decision is here where leasing and borrowing to buy, well, leasing, we're going to be making those monthly payments uh, on whatever the potential asset may be, or are we going to borrow a lump sum to buy the asset outright? So it, it's, e it's going to be an either or sort of question there for you within the exam. Usually when, when you see leasing, it's going to be maybe potentially to be on the lines of a vehicle of some form that a business is looking to put into its operations in the actual scenario. So just to bear that in mind, but try to picture what is going on and then saying, well, what impact is that going to have before and after tax? What are the benefits? Is it going to reduce profit, reduce the profit and incentivize us, such as with the cost of debt, that the actual interest on the debt is going to be tax deductible, lowering that profit, so then we will pay less corporation tax. That is the debt tax shield that you also need to be aware of for the financial management exam. Now, coming on to part B on here, evaluate asset replacement decisions. So again, uh, if you've got a potential vehicle, we'll use the same example so you can keep it in your notes together, using equivalent annual costs and equivalent annual benefits. So this is a cost benefit ana analysis to say, well, should we, and we'll take a vehicle, for example, uh, we'll go a car or a van. Well, if it's an old van or an old car, what are the costs to actually keep that car or van going? And then versus the benefits of it. Well, yes, we're going to have it still being utilized. And, and also to factor in, we wouldn't have to purchase a new vehicle. Whereas on the flip side, you can say, well, okay, we're gonna to have to make a, an asset replacement decision here to say, well, we've got an old car, we've got an old van, it's really not good anymore. We're gonna to have to scrap it, so we might get a positive cash flow there. Then we're gonna to have to purchase a new car or van for so another cash outflow, but then how much are we benefiting and how much are we spending going into this new agreement? These are the sort of scenario base that you could get in a financial management exam. For part C, we're asked to evaluate investment decisions under single period capital rationing, including, so let's just go through them all one by one, uh, the calculation of profitability indexes for divisible investment projects, that's the key bit we'll come back to, the calculation of the MPV of combinations of non-divisible investment projects, and then finally, a discussion of the reasons for capital rationing. So this is where it really comes down to that you may be given a scenario where you're, you're an advisor or a financial manager for an actual company. They're only able to actually invest, say, five million pounds within to an actual business, and they might have five or six options to go into it. Well, what it's saying there for a divisible investment project, well, that means that you can actually invest potentially well, if, if, if you've got a full project, that is going to be one. Um, but then if it's going to be divisible, then maybe maybe it would be a case of from that five million, we could invest three million in one. And then the next one was um, three million as well. OK, so we can only we've got a maximum of five million to invest in that second project. Well, we could only invest 66.667%. So that, that would deem it to be divisible and would utilize the full 5 million for it. Versus, on the other hand, if it's non-divisible, well, if it's non-divisible, then you can only have either or of those two examples. So you've got one project that costs 3 million, another that costs 3 million. You can't divis uh, make it divisible from it. So you'd have to pick one or the other, and then you'd have 2 million of our example to invest elsewhere in the business. And then a discussion for the reasons for capital rationing. So the reasons for the actual rationing means that you're actually utilizing your resources more effectively. You're becoming more resourceful from what you actually have. So can we maybe negotiate a better deal? Can we utilize what we have more effectively? 
Uh, and this is where we can actually make better investing and financing, financing decisions as a financial manager going forward. So these are all things about a discussion that you may be asked within the financial management examination. Know the difference between divisible and non-divisible and the different combinations to say, well, if we've got six projects here, given in the scenario, we've been given a set amount, how much should we be spending on each one and why? That is the key thing. Calculate and explain. That is the key fundamental area, especially within um, investing decisions as we have in here. Well, that the MPV is a really classic exam question for capital rationing, and you have to make that decision with justification as well. So just to recap on investment appraisal from today's lecture, we've gone through the actual techniques where going away from today, you actually need to, first of all, make sure you're comfortable with how to calculate them and also all of the formulas. We've talked about for part two, allowing for inflation and taxation, how it would link into especially MPV, how you're calculating it you using the actual different project lives, when would the cash flows actually be paid and looking at it in terms of real value here. In terms of point three, adjusting for risk and uncertainty in the investment appraisal. So are we looking at it from an optimistic or pessimistic point of view, probability, changing the variables? These are the decisions from a financial manager's point of view that you'd have to put into play. And then finally, um, coming on to part four, specific investment decisions, uh, leasing, buying, asset replacement, capital rationing, decision making, usually looking at if you've got more than one option, what would be the best option, calculating that, and then explaining why. Those are the critical factors that you need to be aware of. Thank you very much for listening today, and I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Well, Ramshad and everyone else who's watching around the world, that is how you go through investment appraisal, all of the key concepts in the ACCA financial management syllabus that is going to help you get some grounded key knowledge that is going to help you with your upcoming examination. If you follow it through, you've got some really key notes down. That is definitely going to help you out because it's such a key topic area. Make sure you take it forward into your question practice, pass paper question practice as well. That is really, truly going to help you pass your upcoming financial management exam. If you have found today's video helpful, which I hope you have going through all those key concepts, make sure you give the video a massive thumbs up and like below. I really appreciate it. And it means that more ACCA students around the world will see this content. If you have any questions on investment appraisal, ACCA, financial management, or you just want to let me know what you thought of the video, feel free to leave me a comment below. I really appreciate it and I answer absolutely all of them. If you would like access to all of my free materials, you know what to do. All you have to do is subscribe, hit the button below so you don't miss out on any future videos that could be the difference in you passing your upcoming ACCA exam. Finally, what I've done for you is I've left a couple of videos down here with all of my financial management resources. So make the most of them, click one of them. They're definitely going to help you pass and could be that difference in making it that 50 plus that you really want to go for. But as always on that bombshell, I'll see you next time. Cheers.